Thank you, Barack, Barack, and um, thank everybody for the opportunity to return to UCSD. My first uh, appearance here was in 1983 at a conference uh, on musical improvisation, uh, which is a very different uh, topic than today's. I've titled my talk today, Religionless Theology and Technoscience. I think my gracious host, Barak Rahami, was a little surprised when I told him that my first graduate education was a Master of Divinity from Andover Newton Theological School in Massachusetts in 1959, and that most of my theology was taught by Paul Tillich, the expatriate from Germany's fleeing Nazism in World War II. He was already at that time in the 1950s somewhat sometimes characterized as an atheist theologian and certainly a religionless one. Religions usually extol some version of confession, so I begin here with some autobiographical confessions. First, my own background religiously was as a German Baptist, closely related to various Anabaptists such as Mennonites, Amish, and other radical communitarian pacifist and congregational de denominations who were despised and killed by both Catholics and Protestants during the Reformation in Europe. German Baptists were, however, pietists, less strict than their Anabaptist counterparts. Uh, we did not drink, dance, gamble, or play cards with the representations of sinful kings, queens, and jacks, but my father smoked, and after, a war, after the war, we welcomed electricity and other modern technologies. Lacking the strict technological assessment practices of the Amish, and we had musical instruments, for example, in our churches, unlike the strictly a cappella music of some of our peers. By the time I was an undergraduate at the University of Kansas, I had moved to the American or Northern Baptists, who had been very strong abolitionists during the Civil War and had a highly liberal or high criticism theology, which was distinctly non-fundamentalist. Politically, my family was a rare group of Kansas Democrats, and I had moved even further left to live in a socialist co-op during my undergraduate days, by which time I was pretty much a democratic socialist. After KU, I was hoping to become a philosophical theologian. I moved to Massachusetts and Andover Newton and continued my leftist moves by the 60s for the reform democratic side, which marched for civil rights, was against the Vietnam War, and in biblical and theological studies favored Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who coined the notion of religionless Christianity. He was executed for his part in an attempt to assassinate Hitler during World War II, and Tillich accepted Bonhoeffer's notion of religionlessness. And so my very f close friend at that time, Harvey Cox, whose secular city helped me end up in Manhattan, one of the world's great secular cities, like the ones Martin Luther Heidegger found scary when he penned his turndown of a call to Berlin from his Black Forest hut where he preferred to stay. I hope now that my confession goes farther that you can follow me because after my PhD and first academic full-time post at Southern Illinois University in 1964, my interest in theology waned while my interest in philosophy waxed. By the time I moved from SIU to Stony Brook in 1969, I had begun to research and publish in what one would call technoscience topics. I had become largely religionless. I did not repudiate what I had learned, and I retained an interest in the critical hermeneutics, biblical text formation, particularly related to archaeology and anthropology, all of which remains a keen interest of mine today. Indeed, The Bible Unearthed, 2001, by Finkelstein and Silberman, two Israeli archaeologists, remains one of my favorites. This book points out that traditional religious archaeology assumed the primacy of biblical texts, with the archaeology following largely to confirm biblical claims. 
Fickelstein and Silberman went to invert that hierarchy and take archaeological evidence as primary and used it to tell what we know about the Hebrew history and biblical formation. I confess my interest was partly to see how close or how far they were from the quite radical studies I followed in theological school. The differences, it turns out, were nuanced, but closer than I would have predicted. Before leaving my confessional mode, I would like to uh, tell one anecdotal tale. In 1993, an Indian literary scholar in Denmark, Anindita Balslev, organized a conference on multiple cultures, and I was a keynote invitee. I went and planned to return to the U.S. right after the conference, but I had met a long, young Danish theologian, Niels Gruniker, who there who persuaded me to stay a little longer and join a second conference on theology and philosophy in Jutland, far northern Denmark. I tried to beg off with my claim that I had not kept up with reading theology in the 34 years since my MDiv, but I could see that from the program that most of the theologians that were being discussed were those that I would recognize from my own theological days, including Bart, Tillich, and Bonhoeffer, and mostly German thinkers, including Michael Till, uh, Tennyson, who was there. So I agreed to go as a sort of commentator. Once underway, I asked critically why the most important theologians were discussing old issues and wondered why the issues raised by feminists, anti-modernists, and postmodern thinkers were not being discussed. The result was funny. I left before the end of the conference, but the young Danish theologians and philosophers and a new Jewish studies friend, Inga Sigemfeldt, liked what I argued for, and I became known as the slayer of German theologians. <laughs> for even before the end of the conference, that tale will be my confessional, and I'll now turn to my topic of religionist theology and technoscience. Although Karl Marx and Ernst Kopp were regularly cited as the 19th century proto-philosophers of technology, there's a wide consensus that in spite of the many philosophers of the early 20th century, including Ortega y Gasset, Karl Jaspers, and others began to cite technology as a worthy philosophical problem, it's clear that Martin Heidegger remains widely regarded as the godfather of philosophy of technology and remains virtually the only early 20th century philosopher still widely cited and written about. Heidegger, in his typical style, often returns to Greek philosophy for his, for his roots. And, at this, and in this case, the, the use of the Greek term techne played a central role. Techne is ambiguous. It can connote artifacts such as we would identify as technologies or tools, but it would also connote objects which are called techne, uh, which would be art objects. And so it's not surprising that latter-day Heideggerians often play uh, with this ambiguity. For example, writers such as Cern Rees of Denmark with his relatively new book, 2018, Unframing Martin Heidegger's Understanding of Technology, uh, and which tries to keep Heidegger relevant to philosophy of technology, or Santiago Zabala's Only Art Can Save Us in 2016, a variant upon only a god can save us, looks at contemporary art examples again as in a secular salvatory role which keeps Heidegger central to the discussion. In technology salvatory, which in my terms would place it close to a kind of scientific utopianism which should be rejected, or is it secular which could place it close to the pre-philosophy of technology characterization characterization of technologies as neutral, a notion today rejected by almost all philosophers of technology, myself included, as the inventor of the neologism non-neutral. And as I reflected upon the notions of techne, art, salvatore, and secular, I began to, as usual, imagine phenomenological variations in very concrete terms. <clears throat> 
Are there religions, religious technologies? The answer would have to be a qualified yes, insofar as there's a long history, multiculturally, of religious artifacts. Bruno Latour, a very eminent philosopher, sociologist, anthropologist of technologies, produced a book in 2002 titled Iconoclash, which we used several times in my technoscience research seminar some years ago. It's a mastery his masterful history of image making and image destruction in many cultures and historical periods, obviously often related to religious clashes regarding iconoclastic and non-iconoclastic movements. Latour, as a French Catholic, belongs to a very long non-iconoclastic tradition, as I, coming from Anabaptist roots, come from a deeply iconoclastic tradition. But to put some distance between these historical tensions, which can be associated with Latour's actor network theory and my post-phenomenology, I'll turn to an example much older and different from either of these religious traditions. I happen to be a collector of what, for me, are art objects from many non-Western cultures. For example, tribal masks from Africa, Tibet, Latin America, Japan, Korea, and many other locations. But amongst these artifacts are others which serve as fertility fetishes from Africa, the Sepik River of New, New Guinea, and other places. My own religious forefathers would not hesitate to call these artifacts idols and should be shunned. But today, hanging in my study walls in Vermont and Manhattan, there are various clearly art, art artifacts lacking any historical fertility or sacred significance. These are in their own use context, close to being magic, which primitively was indeed part of technology. Ironically, this played a role in the indigenous Sepik River cultures. These cultures actually believed that fertility artifacts wore out or lost their usefulness over time. When they were no longer are efficacious, they were simply discarded. When this happened, in my terms, when their shelf life was over, the pile of discarded objects were perceived as valuable by the Jesuit missionaries nearby who would collect these artifacts and sell them from their Australian base, precisely from which I purchased my now art, art objects. If these were once religious technologies, now they are art objects, although for the life of me, I have to skeptically say that I see no way for only art can save us, or for art techne to save Heidegger. My apologies to both San Diego and Søren, whom I both know and regard as brilliant philosophers. I remain convinced that Heidegger's version of philosophy of technology has outlived its shelf life and is no longer as relevant as it once was. Similar in our own religious Western history, the variations on sacred objects has long belonged to our Catholic side. Saints' body parts, virgins, saints' images, and in several cases, post-Reformation parishioners continued to genuflect or fly, uh, in front of repainted church walls, while it's sometimes uncovered hidden uh, icons of pre-Reformation times. All of these are variations of what may be called religion, religious technologies. And a brief look at a second and later generation of philosophy of technologies will explain why. Many interpreters of the history characterized in the first generation of early European philosophy of technology, Heidegger, Jaspers, Igasset, and Ad Elul, a sociologist, are usually dystopian and they are totalizers. Technology, in other words, with a capital T. Much such early work is a negative response to the, neg to the material industrial technologies of the Great War and the Industrial Revolution. Not many tech commentators have done as much with the second generation, who were largely students of the first generation, although Anders and Arendt, 
Both Heidegger students belong here as well as the classical members of the Frankfurt School of Neo-Marxists, Lukács, Adorno, Horkheimer, Marcuse. The third generation is my generation, which often is called the, internal, uh, the empirical turn generation. Received the attention of Hans Ochterhus, a Dutch editor philosopher with American philosophy of technology, the empirical turn in 2001 in English. Borgman, Dreyfus, Bray, Feinberg, Haraway, and Eide, and Winner are the empirical turn philosophers dealt with and they refer to a concrete specific technologies in contrast to technology überhaupt or technology in general. <clears throat> I'll now add to this brief history some arguments and similarities which belong to these philosophies of technology. First, there are actually two predecessors for late 20th century philosophy of technology. I have often pointed out that in both the UK and Europe, two related and often competitive interpretations of science emerged. In the UK, what became known as social constructionism originated in the 70s with the Bath School, and known as SSK, Sociological Studies of Technology. Uh, Trevor Pinch and Harry Collins were among the most prominent names, and in France it was actor network theory uh, with Michel Calon and Bruno Latour, as well as will be seen later, or both returns are to praxis-oriented interpretation, which focuses upon performance and practices of what scientists do rather than upon theory production. I would add that virtually all of the later 20th century interpretations of science were more praxis-oriented than philosophy of science at the time, which remained theory, uh, logic, and uh, language-oriented, or analytic and positivist. Philosophies of technology also were largely out of practice traditions. I would include Marxian, phenomenological hermeneutic, pragmatist traditions among them. But, and this includes at least early Heidegger, the praxis orientation also developed uh, what I call a sensitivity to materiality, in contrast to most classical and even early phenomenology's emphasis upon ideality. For insofar as technologies are natural, are material entities, how can they be used? How can they be used? Calls for paying attention to material structure. In early phenomenology, it was Heidegger above all, who phenomenologically described tool use as early as being in time, 27, and referred to by Merleau-Ponty in Phenomenology of Perception, 45 in, Fr uh, in French. And with his blind man's cane and, long, and uh, woman's long feathered hat and other examples. I would claim too that all major philosophers of technology take technologies to be, as I termed it, non-neutral. This is to say that technologies are from design on created and invented to change or transform experience with some aim. Eyeglasses correct vision, writing technologies produce inscriptions, knives separate joints. But I, in post-phenomenology, would add that all technologies are also multi-stable in that no technology can be predetermined to simply follow its designed in uh, its designed intent. One of my favorite examples is the simple lead or graphic pencil. This simple technology was designed to be a writing tool, but I too well remember in my one-room country school days in Kansas long ago how a classmate, angry at me, stabbed me with a pe lead pencil, leaving the graphite point in my hand later painfully extracted. The pen had become a weapon, and much later I remembered of reading of an accused criminal in Nevada who stabbed a guard during a trial with a lead pencil, and he was immediately shot dead on the spot. Later, checking Google to confirm the date, I discovered several pages of similar uh, courtroom stabbings with pencils, a minor but significant unintended use or multi-stable use for a pen 
materially shaped like a weapon. Science, in this case astronomy, has also discovered multistability. Of the now roughly trillion galaxies observable, there are 13 distinct shapes, finite in number, but far more than this spiral uh, Milky Way, which was until 1924 thought by science to be the only galaxy in the universe. Eventually, astronomy would figure out what shapes turn into other shapes, but the millions of years it takes to, uh, may slow this table of shapes down. Finally, while there is a consensus today that all sciences are technosciences, I hope to show that science has always been technoscience. In short, no instruments or technologies, no science. I am currently working on a multicultural design of Ice Age astronomy, millennia before early modern science to illustrate this. However, as has been, as has been shown above, there have been religious, religious technologies, but these have been but a small friction of technologies overall. Lynn White, <coughs> it has been, uh, who is a very important historian of technologies in his Medieval Technology and Social Change, 1962, showed that well before the Industrial Revolution, there had been a big technology revolution in medieval times stretching through the voyages of discovery. It was, after all, in medieval times that machine labor began to displace both human and animal labor. Very early in these times, big machines such as windmills, water wheels, and large construction cranes, which had lifts that were used to drain the lowlands, Holland, etc., grind grains, and even build cathedrals. Most eliminated human and some eliminated animal labor using water, wind, and simple machines to supply the power. White goes on to show how <coughs> Uh, even taxi meters and later with the import of Chinese cannonry supplied technologies which allowed Europe to become a massive agricultural material and building power in the world. I'll add the comment that these technologies in their local uh, uses were not used for power, so that windmills were used for prayer, sending prayers to the heavens, and cannons were used for uh, festival displays. Many of the large mechanical devices were imported, cannonry from China, windmills from India, where in their homelands they did not serve to change labor. Fireworks were celebratory in China, windmills were used to send prayers skyward, and wheel-based devices were often tied to oxen and horse labor elsewhere. In, in short, many recognizable religious uses elsewhere became building or labor uses in Europe secular technologies, as we might say. The clock was a particularly interesting example. The first mechanical clocks were invented in China a full century and a half before European ones. But calendars, clocks, and all social time devices belonged only to emperors for royal purposes. For example, to count the kids they had. In contrast, while the first European clocks were religiously used, to tell the hours, early clocks had single hands. In monasteries, soon city halls, church clocks began to order social time secularly in Europe, and while the watch, individuals could have time itself. In short, the history of technology shows deep cultural differences, and it remains the case today. Technologies are both multi-stable and multicultural. Ludites and Artificial Intelligence. As I approach the end of my meditation, I want to look into two deep historical variations and their social dimensions at play of today. Above, I look briefly at Lynn White Jr.'s history of medieval technology revolutions, which saw a large change from animal and human labor to machine labor. Cranes began to build cathedrals, simple but large devices utilizing wind and water power first relieved many humans from hard labor. These machines, many still extant, for example, customs cranes along Dutch rivers inside the cathedral of uh, Francis St. Michel, or there are cranes, windmills in Holland that still grind wheat and corn, uh, 
and a few remaining animal wheel devices I have experienced in travels. Leaping backwards in time, the long ramps, for example, used in the Roman raids on Israel's Masada, or even older ones to build the pyramids of Egypt, saw thousands of human laborers raising giant stones to build or to invade are all now gone, but easy to imagine. But what I want to do in this thought experiment is to contrast what might be called a Luddite fear today accompanying another shift in labor. I will see, I will make this quite concrete. Today there is a Luddite fear of automation and AI developments that technological displacement will lead to human unemployment. Luddites appeared in the early Industrial Revolution and they formed gangs to attach and destroy technologies thought to de-skill and destroy human labor jobs. Thus, and I would add literally dozens of examples, John Henry's legend has made him a last stand against the steam-powered pile driver. And to challenge it, he did so by beating a steam uh, pile driver only to die in the process. Worker attacks upon card gilded textile machines, cotton gins and the like, and to me the Kittler example already referred to in the introduction uh, of the typewriter ended up uh, having males, Luddite like, refuse to use this de-skilling device only to have pre-skilled female piano players replace the previous male users as secretaries in the 19th century. This all happened within a single decade. Uh, males dropped out of being secretaries. Females filled all the businesses with typewriters. And now, of course, typewriters are gone. Today, fears of AI and automation replace earlier industrial forms of ludicism particularly as we gradually shift from fossil fuel to remove renewable energy modes of production. I will admit that I find it ironic that in building and maintaining wind turbines or solar power installations seems actually an advice, an advance in quality of work style from digging deep coal in deep mines or environmentally dangerous fracking for gas and oil. Yet what has also emerged is interesting. Americans, at least, are less willing to move to improve the situations. No gold rusts or dust bowl okies uh, are following these technological changes. What is obvious is that there seems to be a greater suspicion concerning technological change today compared to medieval times. Why? Techno fantasies. I'm now going to draw on my long history of studying the history of technologies. One of the first patterns which I opposed from my early beginnings as a philosopher of technology is that any new technology being introduced stimulates first a, what I call a double hype introduction. First, its makers, developers, and originators start off with an exaggerated utopian hype. This technology will make things so much better, it will transform human society. Progress is inevitable. Doing things will be easier on from then on and on. Closely following is an equal but negative dystopian hype. In form, this technology will make things worse. It will threaten for some even human nature, or as I learned from my very first meeting of the Society for Philosophy and Technology, as Hans Jonas proclaimed, we need to develop a, an ethics of fear to stop, for example, human biological tampering with the human. What most people, however, do not appreciate is that a technology gets adapted. Both hype styles tend to recede and usually settle down into something much more mundane or equally likely technologies even more rapidly change and even end their shelf lives. Typewriters, once a technology which I which changed gender life, had a shelf life of roughly 125 years, almost the same as the steam engine railway engines. I was a dean at Stony Brook when uh, SUNY commanded the change from typewriters. Before 1985, no department 
could order word processors. And after 1985, no one could buy a typewriter. I still recall while writing my first book in Paris in 67, 68, reading Emmanuel Monnier's book, Little Fears of the 20th Century, which made some of these same points about fears of new technologies. But utopian and dystopian hype can also lead to techno-fantasies, big imaginative versions of utopian dystopian hype. Sometimes techno-fantasies take literary forms as Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which still today haunts our fears of technologies run amok. Or we still, in many philosophy of technology circles, fear the greatest danger of our times, technology as universal dystopian in framing from Heidegger. And today our 21st century worries include fears of AI and automation replacing us. Yet I wonder if all these little fears of the 21st century, what were the hyper and techno fantasists would have it wrong? If I look back at Hubert Dreyfus's What Computers Can't Do, and I came to MIT in 1958, it was there from age 58 to 64, Dreyfus came in 1960 and left in 1968. So I knew him quite well in those days. Um, his attacks upon old-fashioned AI hinted that perhaps crea uh, calculative intelligence is not really the hard problem for computer AI. He hinted that maybe gracile motility might be a harder problem than a program like Big Blue to program, and one result would have robotics programmers take up this challenge, which today remains a massive problem. An anecdote. Just last year, in July, I attended a major conference in Twente, the Netherlands, and the local museum was displaying a major Frankenstein exhibit, which included a series of videos showing rob robots in various motility trials, such as getting out of a car, trying to climb a stepladder, or even climbing stairs. Over and over again, the videos showed a comedic falling of the robots, failing to perform the simplest tasks of motility. Animal or insect models with four to six legs, each programmed to operate separately like octopus test, uh, tentacles, which we know neurologically have each a brain and did much better. But the humanoid robots with a single brain to issue executive commands, i.e. Cartesian-like, simply failed. My point is, could it be that designers are still using the wrong model for intelligence? Then, if so, how could we fear being replaced by a machine which is better than us? Is what we fear a little worry rather than a big one? So let's recap. There are indeed machine-human replacements. John Henry with a steam pile driver, I suspect today, would find little sympathy for John Henry because in this case, the sheer repetitious labor would appreciate his replacement. The same applies to the 19th century factory system. The mindless labor of the assembly lines, which first had to train humans to do robo uh, re repetitious robot-like atomistic work, today are replaced by robots, which take up the de-skilled earlier human tasks. These variations support, in other words, Humans had to learn to become robots before robots could take over what the humans were doing. These various variations support an argument that if machines can do better and relieve humans of dislikable labor, we should encourage this. And I will push this even farther and hold that anything a machine can do better than us, we ought to let it and move on. Now another case of hype and techno fantasy more recently and yet so telling. I've just read an editorial by Gary Kasparov in, D in Sciences 2000, in Sciences uh, December 2018, which he recalls his defeat by Big Blue in the first major machine versus classic chess master playoff. That was in 1997. This was back in the height of the Dreyfus era, and I was deeply interested. In the editorial, uh, in December of last year, 
Kasparov acknowledges that today chess machines do dominate, but shows how chess is still a model for uh, analyzing reasoning. I think he gives it too much. This is because there is more of the Wizard of Oz to that old context than most people know. In the Wizard of Oz, Dorothy does not heed the don't look behind the curtain where the con man wizard is pulling the levers which create his wizardry, wizardry type. In Deep Blue, the, via, the video is highly staged, showing only Kasparov against the machine. But what is shown is that at breaks between the encounters, there was what amounted to a small army of technician trans, uh, programmers tweaking Deep Blue. In short, this was not Kasparov, the lone human playing against a single machine. It was indeed Kasparov playing against a pile of humans plus a machine. I ask would it have been fairer had Kasparov had an equal small army of chess masters to advise. At the very least, this goes to show that at this stage sitting, there's a lot of hype. Techno fantasy, and we still need Dorothy to reveal that we are not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> now we are open to Q and A. There's a mic here, so. Um, I'm fine, huh? Okay. Uh, I came in late, so I apologize. I was only got part of your thing, but... Okay, uh, I came in late, so I apologize, but, uh, I, but I heard the latter part of your talk. I'm wondering whether it... You, okay, I, I'm wondering whether you have considered that it's not a technological problem, but a political and economic problem in that sense. The, uh, the problem is the example you've shown shows a parallelism in history, but history is also distinguished by the difference as well as the similarities. And the current condition also provides a lot of difference that might knock off or dissuade what the parallel history might be. What I'm worried about is a political and, uh, and economic structure uh, because, you know, like in the 19th century and uh, into the 20th century, because of the Industrial Revolution, th th there's a curve which is called the frown curve. In other words, if we look at development, design, and then production, and then marketing, and so forth, uh, even though the people at the development end and the, uh, and the distribution end uh, is ha more highly paid because uh, uh, economic for the company, the bulk of the profit comes from the production, which means that the division of labor versus uh, the capital, okay? And now it's been transformed to what, what is called the smile curve, because we know through, uh, we kn know through the globalization that what happens is that uh, the production of the goods is not as valuable, but the development and the design is very important. For instance, if you're Apple, you got that. And, and also the, the distribution through marketing, such as branding and so produces excess value. So therefore, the curve is, uh, in a sense, upside down. That's why the profits are up, which means there's a split between the classes. And so unless this new technology, eventually this new technology is going to even displace the workers who are already very lowly paid, let's say in Bangladesh, is going to be displaced. So unless the politics and the economic structure changes, there's going to be a displacement because the profit is driven, driven in that direction. And you need to address that in relationship of how 
the governmental policy as well as the economic policy is going to reflect the distribution of goods and the distribution of money as well as the technology itself. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure you didn't address that issue. Well, let me refer to a couple of things that I've written in the past. Uh, to respond to some of this, I, I'm now at a stage in my thinking where I'm turning very, very anti-mythological and uh, fantasy, uh, anti-fantasy, because I think that the sort of theatricality which accompanies all technological development in, in its uh, attempt to persuade people uh, to do things. Okay, I'll go back. In the 70s, one of the things that I did was to work with the Sloan Foundation. The Sloan Foundation was heavy into what today is called technological literacy. And so I went all through New York State and later through other states, uh, becoming a sort of evaluator of new technologies and meeting with parents so that, for example, when computers were being marketed, the computer companies were putting out vast advertising machines that, uh, or uh, vast advertising, to convince parents that unless you bought your kid the latest laptop, your kid would fall behind in school. I regarded that as a piece of heavy-duty hype. Uh, it, in fact, followed the, the same pattern that uh, one of my colleagues at Stony Brook had studied, a historian of technology, with soap manufacturing. When washing machines were first put into use, uh, they needed soaps. So the soap manufacturers used this as a uh, scare tactic, and they tried to convince all housewives that their children would have too many germs if they didn't have good soap. So they used this as part of the advertising technique to sell soap, just as later on the laptop developers were saying your kids will fall, fall, fall behind. Uh, the fact of the matter is, of course, that all kids learn to use computers very quickly, whether they were their own or others, and uh, so they learned them anyway. And uh, uh, as you can tell today, I mean, I, I had a, a young boy who at age 18 months was able to crawl up the side of a very high place control machine for our uh, uh, hi-fi. And one of the things that he did was to turn the, the knobs from our listening to classical music to boom, 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 boom. And I knew I had lost the battle already at 18 months uh, for what the kid would adopt to. So uh, I think that's, that's one of the fantasy objects. And I think one of my things today is to try to point out how much hype and fantasy there is in the production of all these things uh, used. And this is... This is not really just economic. It's, it's appealing to people's emotions, to people's feelings about things, and uh, they're going accordingly. Uh, I want to uh, anticipate some of the algorithm stuff here. One of the last dissertations that I advised uh, before retiring was by a guy who was doing big data and privacy, which of course is an enormously important topic. Uh, I would say that it was no wonder that he got four job offers immediately in a day in which philosophers are not supposed to get job offers. Uh, but he's, he's now in a very good position, not working in a philosophy department, but working in a, a logistics department at Penn State. And um, uh, I, I've gotten interested in machine learning and, and uh, this kind of stuff. 
it's very, very interesting because one, one thing that is clear is that machine learning has its own kind of intelligence, which is not like our intelligence. I'll give you two examples. Uh, big data, for example, has tried to teach machines how to recognize camouflage tanks. And uh, in recognizing camouflage tanks, uh, the machine discovers that most camouflage tanks are to be found in forests. So what it does is it looks for forests, and luckily enough, it will find now a few camouflage tanks stuck in forests. Uh, I don't think any human would call that uh, intelligence in a human sense at all, but that's the way it turns out. There's another example I have uh, with um, a sort of medical diagnosis in which a machine discovered that people who have asthma uh, tend to get much better results in being taken care of than people who don't have asthma. And uh, that's simply because people, the, the docs already recognize that asthma is a serious problem in treatment. And so uh, the, while the machine is, is arguing in effect that asthma is a serious cause uh, that requires medical attention, and it's right about that, uh, still uh, out of all of the possible diagnoses that could be made of the vast majority of people uh, with these diseases, it's not asthma which is the cause, it's asthma which is the effect of having better uh, care. So I remain somewhat skeptical of the claims for hyperintelligence of uh, big data. Uh, it's different, it's interesting, and I'm not afraid of it. Uh, because I think if, if you can find ways to get humans into doing better jobs, I think one of the big problems today, for example, in getting rid of fossil fuel is precisely this kind of phenomenon. Everybody knows that if you go to work on uh, taking care of uh, wind turbines or so forth, it requires a fair amount of education and knowledge, which our group of pro-Trumpites uh, doesn't want to undertake. We have time for uh, one more question. I want to ask actually two. Um, so, more to tell which one. So, uh, we just need, yeah. Excuse me. So thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm Caleb Scoville. I'm a doctoral candidate at UC Berkeley. Uh, I, I want to raise a question about uh, technology and history and politics. Um, and I, I want to draw on a, a couple concepts that you raised. Um, one is this multi-stability of technology. Um, and another is this non-neutrality of technology. And I'm, um, so the, the example that you raised about multi-stability uh, was with respect to religion, religious uh, artifacts becoming secular. Um, and I'm, I want to just probe you on the role of, of politics uh, as well. So um, if we pose that maybe technologies are not politically neutral, um, is it possible that they, they're also sort of a, a, a multi-stable politics of technologies as well? So the question being, do you see technologies as a sort of mover of history vis-a-vis -vis politics? Uh, and if so, how would you understand that? Do, do you understand technologies to be uh, a sort of a mover or an engine of history in terms of technologies, uh, sorry, in, in terms of I, I politics? Think we're at a stage uh, regarding technology now where we all realize some basic things that uh, philosophers of technology have accomplished, and that is that you, uh, whereas it may not be the case that technology is the only factor in what is going on, it, uh, 
every technology is, in my terms, non-neutral. And uh, therefore, what you need to do is to find out the, uh, what the non-neutrality is. Uh, let me turn back to philosophy of science for a moment. My theory of philosophy of science is no, uh, no instruments, no science. Uh, this was the case with uh, Democritus, for example, in ancient Greece. Uh, he came up with the notion of uh, an atom and described an atom, although he also claimed at the same time that atoms were A, imperceptible, not only in fact, but in, in principle. Uh, I happen to be, philosophically speaking, an anti-essentialist. I think that the question of an essence of technology is ridiculous and should be eliminated entirely. And you look at the technologies that are uh, actually involved. That's the so-called empirical turn. Uh, but uh, I think we're all convinced that technologies do make a difference. And I think philosophers of technology look at what those differences are. Uh, this is not to say that there are other factors uh, involved, such as organization of corporations, uh, power factors, et cetera. I guess to I, rephrase... In other words, I recognize Sorry. that the philosophy of technology cannot uh, answer all questions, just some of them. To rephrase slightly, I was just wondering, with the relationship between this multi-stability and uh, non-neutrality, because if something is not neutral, um, maybe there's an, an inherent politics to it. But if it's multi-stable, there might be multiple politics in which it enables. So I'm wondering if you see this as a, as a, as a space of movement within technologies, politically speaking. I, I think that politics and philosophy of technology ought to reciprocate with each other, in other words. Uh, but I don't think that uh, going back to, let's say, a totally political or social uh, aspect will do it. Um, thank you so much. We do have to end our um, lecture, uh, given the fact that uh, we have a coffee a session coming up and, of course, the next panel. Uh, but before we do that, I want us to thank Professor uh, Don Aide for a wonderful lecture. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And there was coffee and sweets outside. We'll come back in 10 minutes or so for our um, morning panel. <laughs>